Our next panel is going to talk about a program that um, is an innovative program that was done in um, Ramsey County through Goodwill Easter Seals. And we're going to have two presenters. Peter Baird, who is from MDRC, um, who has been working on the evaluation of the program, and Boyd Brown, um, who has been directing the program. And the program they're going to talk about is called Families Achieving Sussex, Sus yeah, Success Today, which is a multidisciplinary, co-located, collaborative effort serving Ramsey County MFIPS in the Family Stabilization um, Services. So it was really trying to um, address employment among families who have very limited access to jobs often. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter first. Great. And then Boyd will follow. Thanks very much. Is this working here? It is. Yeah. Sorry to be so loud. Yeah. And Boyd, where's our presentation? Thank you so much. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thanks very much. I want to especially thank uh, Kate Robert for inviting me and Boyd for having me come in. Um, I'm a New Englander, go Red Sox. So, and I worked a lot in state government in New England. But, uh, but I, we always had a, I've done a lot of work in Minnesota in the past, partly because I always think there's an affinity between us Northeasterners and the upper Midwest and maybe Oregon too or something um, in terms of how we approach issues. Um, I don't know that much about brain science. This has been an interesting day for me. Um, most, almost my entire professional life has been in disability and in employment for people with disabilities. Even TANF is a kind of a new subject to me um, just in the last few years. But I, so, I, so our findings here, at least from my perspective especially, is really going to be a straight, straight presentation on what we, what we found under FAST and the employment outcomes we had under that, which, I, which we are very excited about. Um, but I think you know, one of our, our tasks here today is to talk, I think Boyd's going to do this somewhat and we can do it afterwards, is just to talk about how, how, how the individualized placement and support model, which is kind of core to FAST, how that played a key role in uh, how that uses executive functioning brain science, because I think it does. It uses a lot around resilience and motivation and, and even uh, being uh, mindful and things like that, you know, in terms of this. But also, how it can be, how can uh, brain science improve what, what IPS and what, uh, what, what FAST has done? Um, you know, just to give away the punchline here, while we saw pretty dramatic increases in employment under this program, the reality is almost, all the, almost everyone's still living in poverty. You know, even if they are working. So, I mean, if you believe that people with disabilities can and, and should achieve gainful employment, which I certainly do, and I know Boyd does, the question is, well, how can other techniques feed into that to really help us achieve the goals that we set for ourselves here? Um, fast, fast, which uh, Donna briefly described, is uh, was under a larger grant called the TANF SSI um, Disability Transition Project, or TSDTP. We call it TANF SSI because TSDTP is unpronounceable and nobody knows what it means. Um, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was TSTTP is really unique, or TANF SSI is a really unique program that was jointly funded by two federal agencies, ACF, uh, the Agency for Children and Families, and the Social Security Administration. It's very rare, I don't know if you do a lot of federal grants, but it's very rare to have two federal agencies uh, fund something together. It's, it's a great opportunity, but it's also an incredible challenge in terms of having to deal with two project officers and their, their competition for, for ideas and attention. Um, it, it, TANF SSI included two phases. One was the, um, a phase one, which is really a knowledge development phase. What we did is we, I think it was one of the first times TANF data on a national scale and SSA data was really matched to look at the interaction between the two programs. And during phase one, we also developed pilots. Uh, we contacted eight or nine states and tried to develop pilots in Minnesota. Was, Ramsey County was chosen as one of the pilots. Um, and I'll really briefly describe the other two. So I, I want to talk first about the findings in brief from phase one, um, which is the matching of the data and sort of the early work we did. And then Boyd's going to describe the FAST program in detail. And then I'll come back at the end to talk about some of the impacts we had under that program. Um, but some of the findings from phase one, first we saw the fairly high level of disability among adults in the TANF program. There's a lot of people with disabilities in TANF. Um, we, it was somewhere between 30 and 45 percent. It could be even larger than this if you really count depression, you know, moderate depression and things like that. So, so TANF has a fair amount of people with disabilities being served by the program. However, only a fraction of those ever get on SSI or SSDI. Only a fraction ever get on the federal disability programs. So there's a lot of people with uh, either self-identified or with other work limitations related to disability who are not being attached to Social Security at all. Most of the TANF programs have a policies that exempt individuals from work requirements. 
Um, but we found that looking at doing work all over the country, and we knew this already, when exempted, this population is largely overlooked. Um, a typical TANF agency, I'm not saying Minnesota does this, but a typical TANF agency gets them exempted. It gets individuals that they say have a disability exempted from TANF work requirements, and they go, phew, I don't have to work with them anymore. We can just kind of put them on the back burner. The problem is they're still using their TANF time limits. They're not achieving any goals. They're, you know, they're, their kids won't stay kids forever. <laughs> you know, TANF is not a lifetime benefit. So it's a, uh, so it's, there's, you know, there's a problem there. And very few employment services are offered by TANF agencies, again, on a national scale, that target disability. Um, Minnesota is actually one of the few states we thought that really had a, some disability focus, but most states don't at all to have any kind of disability uh, focused employment supports within their TANF program. There's also very little interaction between TANF and SSA. TANF uh, caseworkers and TANF agencies really don't understand the Social Security program and vice versa. The Social Security program has no idea what TANF does, so there's not a lot of knowledge back and forth there. So we did a, so one of the things we did was look at a 10-year analysis of the TANF and SSA data. Um, and this really, this data challenged conventional wisdom. One of our, one of the thoughts that I know Social Security and ACF had, and this was, I don't know if anybody heard the NPR story on TANF moving people to Social Security, but this, there's this idea that TANF, you know, is a shrinking program. They push a lot of people onto Social Security and they're, they're responsible for some of the growth in Social Security disability roles. Um, the, the really, the, our findings really challenge this. Um, first, that TANF rules don't push recipients onto SSI. It doesn't mean that some TANF agencies are trying to do this, some clearly are. They're just not very good at it at some level. Um, <laughs> and second, they're, um, they're, they're, they're just not, they're, just, they're not very good, you know, they're not, just because they say you have a disability, it doesn't mean Social Security is gonna have, find them to have a disability. So less than 10% of TANF recipients ever apply to SSI on a national scale. So it's pretty, it's lower than I think what many thought. Um, SSI caseloads are not growing because of TANF, because of TANF. Um, it kind of makes sense when you think about it. TANF is a really small program that's been shrinking nationally, sometimes dramatically, so all over the country. Social Security is an ex disability is an exploding program, SSI and SSDI. You know, it's, it's tripled in the size that TANF has been cut in half. So it's just, there's only so much TANF could do to grow the program, even if they were good at getting people onto Social SSI, which they're not. Um, TANF recipients are also not particularly likely to be accepted, or not, not any less likely to be accepted onto SSI. I think there's this idea that TANF agencies are throwing people at Social Security and they were all being rejected. But the, the, the typical person who comes from TANF and applies for SSI or SSDI um, had about the same chance of getting on, slightly lower than any other person who applied. About a third of the people who initially applied were, were accepted and then there's an appeals process where some more people get on. Um, and also, one thing that I think did surprise us a little bit is TANF recipients are not more likely to apply for SSI when they approach their time limit. You know, someone who's timing off of TANF, you think they, they, they will go rush to SSI to stay on benefits, but we really didn't see a jump there. Um, so there are three pilots that I'll, that I'll turn it over to Boyd talking about. Um, the, I'll start with Los Angeles. It, their goal is just to improve the SSI advocacy program. ACF and SSA had a lot of goals and sometimes conflicting goals in this project. But one they wanted to, one of their clear goals is they wanted to help people um, who should be on SSI, who are on TANF now, help them with that process. And some states do a fair amount of SSI advocacy. And so a Los Angeles pilot was really focused on that. Their other goals were really around um, better identification of people with disabilities and better employment supports for people with disabilities in the TANF system. Um, Muskegon County of Michigan tried to combine both of those. They tried to better identify who in, their, who in their TANF system might have a disability and get them to SSI. But if they thought they weren't going to get on SSI, they tried to provide them with improved employment supports. Ramsey County, which I'll let Boyd describe, really focused more on the um, increasing employment among retainer recipients with disabilities. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna talk about uh, Families Achieving Success Today project. So as Peter mentioned, this is one of three pilot projects um, that were funded, and um, we are fortunate to know now that our results were actually quite good. Um, I wanna talk a little bit, before I get started even on this part, is you know, how is this connected to brain science, and you know, why am I, you know, why, what's the interest between FAST and, and brain science research and, and why I'm interested. Um, in looking at our FAST results and looking at what we did in FAST, which I'll go through, 
I definitely absolutely see connections between executive functioning, improving people's executive functioning, and how that re resulted in some of the results we have. And specifically, I'm going to talk about a specific evidence-based practice called Individual Placement Support, IPS, that's been used in the disability community for a decade or more, that we, for the first time um, in this country, have now applying that to a TANF population, which we did here in FAST. And if you look at IPS, and I'm going to talk about that, how some of the pieces of IPS really do connect to this executive functioning and what we need to do to help people moving forward and building those skills they need to move forward. So what's the motivation behind uh, families achieving success today? Um, first, you know, who, the families that we were serving. Um, these are family stabilization uh, services families. So for those of that you, you don't know TANF as well or MFIP here in Minnesota, there's a subset of families that are on uh, MFIP that are um, exempted uh, from the work participation rate. And so Peter mentioned that, that um, even those that, are, those that are exempted in many states receive no services at all, or just like, oh, I'm so glad, get them off my caseload. Here in Minnesota, that's not true. <laughs> we have something called FSS, Family Stabilization, where they do get uh, uh, some level of services um, when they are exempted from the work requirements. So what we try to do in FAST is actually work with these families um, in a different way, and that is this IPS, this Individual Placement Support Model, which I'll go into a little bit more here, um, and see, do, will that make a difference in their employment outcomes versus just getting standard FSS services? Um, so who are these families? Um, hearing Judy speak, they're very similar to what she was talking about. Uh, most of the families, the, uh, the adult, the, in the family has a disability. It's generally mental health, a mental illness, a serious mental illness. Um, it could be low IQ. It can be other physical disabilities. Uh, many times they have co-occurring uh, things going on, um, as well as the children. As Judy mentioned, that uh, the number of children in these families that also have disabilities is quite significant and quite high. The majority of the families are single parent, pr primarily female head of household. Um, and so you can see there's some similarities between what um, Judy was mentioning in the program that we have. Um, another, mo so what are some of the motivations around us starting? One is the growing number of FSS families. Uh, when we started this program, and I believe it's still fairly similar today, half of Ramsey County's caseload is now FSS. And what they know is that folks um, and families that are put into the FSS category, they're much more likely to go on to long-term uh, extended um, MFIP. So basically, after the 60 months, people can get ex extended into post-60 months uh, services. And so if they're on FSS, they're much more likely to that to happen. And plus, they're much more likely to remain poor and in poverty. Another piece I wanted to mention is um, a study around the long reach of early childhood poverty. Um, this was a, a study that was done, um, and it was a national repre representative sample of U.S. families and children that had started in 1968. And they followed these children, um, be born between 1968 and 75, and collected this information, then re-looked at what happened to the, these children when they're between the ages of 30 and 37. And they're specifically looking at poverty. I know um, Donna mentioned in her initial comments about poverty and the impacts that poverty in early childhood could have, do have on um, those children when they grow up. And so that's one of the things we were focusing on. And so what the study showed is that those children uh, that were living in uh, significant poverty, when they get, got to that age of 30 to 37, they had two fewer, fewer years of schooling um, than those that were at, tw uh, at least twice above the poverty level earned less than half as much money, worked 451 fewer hours per year, they received $826 per year more in food support, uh, were nearly three times as likely to report poor health outcomes, and uh, the males in the group were twice as likely to be arrested. And for females, it was associated with a higher uh, level of uh, bearing children out of wedlock. Um, so with that being said, so that's depressing. 
So what was the glimmer of hope? What's the glimmer of hope in that study? And what they did find, and this is what we really held on to for this project, is that with in early childhood with incomes below $25,000, if you could just boost that income by $3,000 annually, they saw significant improvements for those children when they uh, grew up. Uh, most specifically in school achievement, they also had a 17% increase in adult earnings, as well as similar increases in work hours. So when we looked at this project, we wanted to look at is how can we um, with these folks with uh, significant barriers to employment, how can we increase that employment um, in those families um, using these uh, strategies? A couple of other things around motiv uh, motivation and how we got started. The other thing we saw, um, transitional work or supported work, you might know it by, is a, a work experience, a transitional work experience for folks. Ramsey County has done that for years um, uh, for families and, in, in MFIP. And, uh, one of the things they wanted to try is to say, let's put some folks that are in FSS or in the FSS category and let them try out uh, transitional work experience. And what they found is these folks really do want to work, even though they, um, they are exempted from work now because they have documentation saying that they can't work. Um, and so they, they had a good experience with that. And also, as Peter mentioned, the experience with SSI advocacy services, um, actually Goodwill Easter Seals um, actually provided SSI advocacy for Ramsey County, and we did a great job. No. <laughs> um, but the one thing that's true about it is there is a lot of folks, what we found is if, if we actually applied with them, we actually had a very uh, significant number. I think we we're around 70 to 75% actually got on Social Security. We had a lot of people that were referred to us that were not eligible. So these are folks that absolutely have disabilities, but they do not reach that threshold of um, Social Security disability. So we wanted to say, so what can we do with these folks? If Social Security is not the path, let's look at work. So it's a collaboration. Um, so this project is a collaboration of five agencies. Uh, first, of course, is Ramsey County Workforce Solutions. Um, they provide the oversight and coordination of the partnership, the funding, as well as along with the uh, Minnesota Department of Human Services uh, funding as well to fund this project. Um, they coordinate the evaluation uh, of the project as well. Goodwill Easter Seals Minnesota, we were the lead agency. Uh, we provided the expertise in uh, individual placement support. You'll see it says SE, supported employment. That's another term for it, but we specifically were using IPS. We provided adult mental health uh, services as part of this project, as well as some other services, including adult rehabilitative mental health services, or ARMS, as well as some other vocational rehabilitation type services. Another partner is Hired. Um, they are a longstanding provider here in Minnesota of MFIP services, and they um, provided the uh, three FSS coordinators for the project. Uh, basically, these folks were the case managers uh, for the individuals, the families we were serving, and basically coordinated all the other services that we provided uh, with them. Open Cities Health Center. Uh, we wanted to also include physical health services as well. So we had a community health worker as well as a uh, nurse practitioner as well. Um, and also we also had access to their full range of medical services in their clinic, which was down the street from our location. And then last but not least, People Inc. Um, they provided children's mental health service services. Um, and they do, uh, the, the worker that we have for that really does a lot of work in the home, in the community, helping them. We, heard a lot of some about IEPs and working with schools and helping uh, the families with that process. So with this project, we really wanted to create a new experience for families. Um, at the beginning, it was mentioned that it was multidisciplinary, co-located, and integrated. I meant you heard all of those disciplines that were involved in this project, and so that's the multidisciplinary nature of it. Um, additionally, it was co-located, so we brought those services under one roof. Um, so that was one, another aspect of the project. And last but not least, it's, it's around the integration. And this is where I think was somewhat unique from other projects. Because you always hear about, oh, we partner, we're working together, this is a collaboration. But we really looked at what does that collaboration need to look like for these families. And so we looked at both horizontal and vertical integration of the project. So from a horizontal perspective, um, 
I'll just talk about a few of those aspects. One is we had weekly multidisciplinary meetings. So this team was brought together uh, to talk about the families we were serving. They brought when they first came in, we talked about what should be in their plan, talked about what goals they're, they're wanting to do, and then really looking at what services do they need to access and be a part of to really move um, up um, to, to uh, gain, meet their goals, basically, and, and uh, reach their goals. Um, another aspect of that is all the providers were trained uh, together on uh, the services that are provided by the other, uh, um, by the other providers. They got to know each other. I mean, a lot of, as you know, it's really not those formal relationships, it's those informal relationships that are, are gained. The, your, those talks in the hallway about client X, participant X, you know, family Y, those kinds of things. Um, and as well as we had a shared database. So all information was uh, clearly put together. People could um, really access that data um, and know what was happening with that family. Um, and so along with that is the vertical integration, and this is important as well. As you can imagine, when you have five agencies coming together, you all have different ideas, different values, different, you know, how should we work this? And so we had an oversight committee that had all the decision makers from that, those agencies working together that would meet early on monthly, uh, now it's on a quarterly basis, to really, so that we can make decisions as a group for the collaboration. Um, and in addition to that, we had one manager um, who was employed by Goodwill Easter Seals who really oversaw that day-to-day -day operations um, so that making sure that the services really were coordinated and integrated across those teams and then bringing it up to that oversight committee for any decisions that needed to be made. Another part of that experience was this strong message of emphasizing abilities, opportunities, and options. We heard Judy really talk a lot about that around options, that this really is participant-driven. These are their goals. We're there. It's, I, I love the term co-investment. Um, it's really co-investing with them. It's really we're guiding them, but it really, in the end, it's their goals. But at the same time, it's really a strong message, and our message was is that employment is an option for you that um, and that we can help you get there. Um, let's see. Plus, we had uh, definitely lower caseloads um, than standard TANF, but not much lower, um, depending on which county you're from. <laughs> but uh, our caseloads were around for the case, for the FSS coordinator around 50. Um, I know in, in uh, Ramsey County, caseloads can reach as high as 100. Um, in uh, regular MFIP and so forth, but obviously that really did help with that engagement um, and really getting people involved and also we could really be flexible about where we met people, where they felt comfortable. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about individual placement support. I mentioned it a couple of times already. Um, this is an evidence-based practice in the disability community, primarily in, in mental health. Um, that's where it's kind of been born out of, grown out of. Um, study after study, and I'm talking at least a dozen studies, um, randomized controlled trials have shown that employment, it, you can impl increase employment by using this model um, with folks with serious mental illness. Um, and so what we wanted to do was take that model and look at how would that look in a TANF or MFIP context. Um, and what do we need to change? You know, what can stay the same, that sort of thing. So some of the key pieces around IPS, and I'll get into more of the core principles, but that job search is really client-focused. It's really about what the, the participant wants, uh, what their goals are, what their dreams or passions are about, and it's client-paced. It's, it's really, we are, we're along with them, guiding them side by side, um, working with them. We, uh, the placement staff that were involved, uh, really worked with employers in the community from diverse fields, offering broad options for employment. Um, a lot of times, and I think this is part of that executive function, you talk about they want a job, they want a job now, and in their mind, it's very limited what a job means to them. Is It's usually, you know, hospitality, food service, this very limited view of what employment is. So we work really hard the employment specialists work really hard to look, help them broaden those options, really think more fully about 
what are those jobs? What, what are those career options in the community? And to break away from those um, narrow focus focuses. Um, all right, moving on. So individual placement and support core principles. Um, so these are the core principles of um, IPS. On its face, when you just look at these, you're like, yeah, that seems easy, but I can tell you it's not easy, especially in a TANF context, which I'll talk about um, some of those pieces and how it's difficult. But eligibility is based on individual choice. That's great, but if you think about that from an MFIP perspective, MFIP has a lot of parameters, a lot of guidelines, a lot of things you must follow. And so how can we make this, you know, from an IPS perspective work that it's really about for them to decide when they're ready, willing, able to move into work. Um, Supported employment is closely integrated with mental health treatment. Um, so as I mentioned, this has been um, uh, tested in the, uh, for on folks with serious mental illness. And so one of the pieces they have found through the research is that it really, you really do need that close integration between mental health and the employment specialist. So our team has both the employment specialist and the mental health team together integrated and coordinating services. And what's really interesting about this, if you think of this from an executive functioning standpoint, and you think of you know, some of the, you, you think about mental health treatment, you think about arms, and you think about life skill building, because we have folks that are in arms as well, and cognitive behavioral therapy. And really, a lot of that is around really developing those skills around pausing, reflecting, thinking about your choices that you make. And so it's just interesting when, we, when I think of this model and thinking of that integration between mental health and employment, we are doing that every day. And when you have that integration, the employment specialists along with the mental health team are working that. So it's, it's really, um, they're continuously emphasizing that and across the disciplines that are working with these folks. Um, competitive employment is the goal. You know, of course, in MFIP, yep, competitive employment is the goal. Um, I think one of the differences here, in, in context, if you think about the disability community and uh, folks with disabilities, they've been told a long time they can't work um, and said that you need to really work on your treatment and your you know, feeling better and recovery before you can work. And so this model really turns that upside down. It says, no, work is now. The difference when you think of an MFIP or a TANF context versus here is that it's really based on that client choice. It's not based on what MFIP is telling you uh, what you need to do. Uh, job search starts when an individual expresses interest in working. This is really key when you think of motivation and, and people being motivated, or if, if you're familiar with motivational interviewing, when someone starts showing that some change talk, they have some ambivalence saying, you know what, maybe I do wanna try that on, I wanna try some work, maybe that is something, you wanna move on that immediately. And that's what this model does. It's really moving quickly um, towards employment as soon as they're, they're showing that, yep, this is the direction I wanna go. Systematic job development, I mentioned this. The ESCs work very hard on looking and working directly with employers, finding those jobs um, that are outside the norm, the things that, a diversity of jobs so that folks really have a clear view of what their options are and where that may lead them. Follow along supports are continuous. Um, as in thinking of Judy's program and having a five year, that five year window, this takes a long time. And so uh, to really make those changes in people's life and really getting them moving forward. And so that's why in this project or in this uh, particular model, follow along supports are continuous. I talked about individual preferences are important and benefits counseling is part of the employment decision making process too. This is really interesting um, for this particular project because you know, in the disability community, if someone's on social security, of course you really need to think about how does employment impact their benefits. And so when we started talking about MFIP, we talked about you know, work always pays, if you're familiar with you know, that discussion. But when, when working with these families, we also notice they, they're very complex. There's lots of different <laughs> funding sources that come into that family and things that you need to think about. So when that adult in the household does become employed, how is that really truly going to impact their benefits beyond just MFIP, but across many different funding sources that are coming into that household? And so that really truly is important. 
Um, implementation challenges. One of the things, you know, being part of a randomized controlled study, high profile, you know, from federal government funded, you never want to be studied the first year of implementation, but that's what happened to us. So <laughs> luckily we, we still had some good results anyway. But so some of the, you know, we were not fully staffed the first year. Um, and so now we are, uh, you know, after the first year, but that, that definitely impacted us. And despite that, um, we still had some good outcomes, which we'll be, be getting to. Some of the other implementation challenges, and this is related to executive functioning. Um, when you think of MFIP, a lot of you in the room are familiar with MFIP. Paperwork requirements can be quite onerous. And it was interesting at one of the breaks, I was talking to somebody about P folks on, on MFIP have different jobs. One is they're a parent, which is challenging in and of itself. One of them is maybe they're working, very challenging. You know, and, and you know, how do you keep organizing that? But then the th another thing you always have to keep in mind is they need to keep their benefits going. And those of you that work in this field and are on the ground, you understand that can be really challenging. And we're talking about folks that have diminished capacity around executive functioning and be able to organize and juggle and, and so forth. It's really challenging. And lots of times we have families and adults, I mean, they're spending their entire day running around trying to keep all their benefits going and juggling all of that along with their children and jobs and so forth. Um, so that was definitely a challenge. And what we found is when our, in our team meetings is that we have spent so much time talking about, oh, did they get their household report form in? Oh, did they get this, da, 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 da. We just said, you know what? We gotta turn this on its head. We started the meeting talking about what are their goals? Where are they going to? Where, you know, uh, and then left those issues to the end of the meeting. So we really could help people move forward. Um, mandatory nature of MFIP. I think that I've probably already alluded to this to, to some extent. IPS is really grounded in this is not mandatory. It's voluntary. It's really based on client choice, client pace, um, and moving forward. And with MFIP, there's a lot of things that are mandatory they need to do. And then time unlimited support. I mean, we want folks off MFIP, and we've we had this happen several times, quite a few times, in this project where they go off MFIP, and then the supports just drop out. And so we tried with this project to continue those supports through other sorts of um, funding mechanisms, such as extended employment. Uh, sometimes we just kept working with them anyway. Um, because we really wanted to be able to support them longer term as, as long as they wanted those supports. Um, another aspect of IPS is that, you know, since it's been around a long time, um, IPS actually comes out of Dartmouth, um, and they have actually developed fidelity scales um, to help you review your programs to determine do you have strong fidelity to the model. Um, so we actually did have, and actually I see one of our IPS reviewers in the audience right now, um, <laughs> uh, to see did we have high fidelity with the program. And uh, what we found in our first, it was probably, I think it's still in our first year when we did this, is that we had fair fidelity. Um, it was poor, fair, good, excellent. Sounds bad on its surface. However, what I learned is most programs within their first year of, of doing IPS um, are definitely in the fair category. We were actually one of the highest they had seen in the first year. So we felt actually quite good about that. And we definitely feel now at this point that we would be in the good category when it comes to fidelity. But as I mentioned, some of the challenges of, of that MFIP to IPS um, like the mandatory participation, the, integ the integration of mental health employment can be uh, difficult, um, and also the time unlimited supports. That kind of lowered our score a little bit, but overall we were doing a good job. Um, I'm gonna skip that one. So I wanna get on to lessons learned um, from my perspective, just from, first of all, I just wanna thank both um, Ramsey County as well as the state, uh, Minnesota Department of Human Services. They really were strong supporters of this program. Without them, it would not have been as successful as it is. Um, so I, I just wanna put that out there. Um, staff were assigned new roles, but adapted. If you think of an MFIP counselor, primarily they're the primary employment counselor. 
or you know, helping with employment. In this model, they really were more like a mental health case manager, if you know what that role is more like, really coordinating services in the project. And then we had a separate person, an uh, employment specialist that was really focused on the employment, but they adapted well to that. And as I mentioned, services strengthened over time and the analysis that you'll be seeing may not capture that because um, I think we're much stronger now than we were uh, the first year. Um, adapting IPS, I mentioned that, can be challenging, but it is doable. Um, all of our, most of our folks definitely have multiple barriers to employment. Uh, the other thing is, is once folks were off MFIP, and this is around the post-employment, it was difficult to keep them engaged longer term. Um, we continue to work on that. Um, but that is difficult because basically when they're off MFIP, they're like, get out of my life. And so how can we continue that engagement? And then now we'll be talking about the one-year impacts. All right. So I understand I'm standing between all of you and lunch, so I'll try to be <laughs> efficient. Um, so we looked at one-year impacts under this, this program. Ideally, as Boyd said, we would look at longer-term impacts. We just weren't funded to do so. And I, you know, I, I'll talk about this in a second, but we think pro program services improved like our, through our qualitative analysis. We thought they improved a lot, too. So you know, it's a good sign that we had impacts in our first year. Um, but the one-year impacts on earnings, um, uh, first of all, we did a random assignment design where we had um, 241 treatment cases and 148 control cases uh, just to lay any ethical concerns, the control group got what they would have gotten without FAST. So they got normal MFIP and FSS services in the state. And, but it was, uh, it's just, this for us is a fairly small random assignment project. We often deal with much larger numbers. Um, larger numbers gives you more statistical power, so it's harder to detect an impact with smaller numbers, but we, we still did despite what we think was a fairly small um, program evaluated only one year out. Um, overall, we did an implementation, uh, first we did an implant, uh, implementation analysis, um, and we think that FAST is well delivered with a high level of collaboration. As I said, we think program services improved. There was a real key point, I think, when Dartmouth came in and that IPS training, I think fidelity to that model definitely improved after that. Um, participants did have high levels of disability. Um, they needed significant soft supports around, around benefits, around family situations, mental health counseling. Things, uh, and things of that nature. Um, and the program did, we think, very successfully communicate a very strong message about employment. Employment first, the importance of employment. You know, really, um, IPS was born out of a mental health model that often told people to take their drugs and stay at home so they don't get stressed out, which is actually one of the worst things you could do to someone, I think, who's really seriously depressed. Um, and, you know, the, the, talking about employment being a key part of what people should be doing is an is a, is a important part of IPS, and we think FAST did this very well. One thing that, that, that also added to the interesting part of the findings is only 63% of the people in our treatment group, of so that 248 people, only 63% participated in FAST. Um, so there's, there's a lot of people who you know, were put in a control group who never engaged in FAST services. Some of them, I, I don't remember all the reasons, some of them aged off right away, and then there, there was, they, they timed off, and there was other reasons why they didn't take part. So only a, six, only a sample of the people in the treatment group actually got FAST. Um, but participation levels were fairly high for both the FAST and control group participation in MFIP services. Um, consistent with the individualized placement and support model, the FAST group was more likely to participate in job search and job placement. Um, the control group, which didn't get FAST, was more likely to uh, participate in education and training. Um, this is something that, that you see a lot with IPS programs. Um, another thing that the mental health system had traditionally done was they always did job prep. Basically, they kept people in job preparation for 20 years, but um, it was not, you know, it was something people were never ready to work. FAST and IPS really tries to turn that on their head, saying, you're ready to work now, you know, and we'll, we'll help you with whatever support you need to get there. So the FAST group was more likely to participate in directly in job search and placement, and the control group was more likely to engage in education and training. Uh, the FAST group did meet with clients more than the control group, too. Um, so our impact findings. The uh, FAST increased employment um, if in quarter one and quarter three after engaging in services, we saw a statistically significant increase in earnings. And over the one year follow up period, the FAST group um, earned 75% uh, more than the control group, though that 75% was $1,235. So we are, as I said earlier, we're talking about maybe in dollar terms, not huge increases, but they were statistically, you know, in terms of percentage increase quite large. Um, 
And the fast group was less likely to receive TANF in the first two quarters following a random assignment, but this again goes away in quarter three. Mary Farrell, who actually led up the evaluation, um, who's here, I should have mentioned you earlier. Um, we've been thinking about this and don't think we totally understand it. Would you agree, Brett? Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the intention. It wasn't the, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't really the intention. I don't know if it, the quick engagement in employment impacted some people early on or mm -hmm. they, they left TANF right away. We're not totally sure um, what happened there. So some policy implications. First, I just want to say that um, uh, IPS is, is a really well-studied employment service in the mental health world, and it's consistently shown through multiple randomized controlled trials, you know, the gold standard of research, to have impacts. Um, this is, as far as I know, one of the first tests of IPS outside of the mental health world. And the fact that we could basically take a almost un, un, unchanged IPS model, I mean, you had to make little changes because you have to, but basically unchanged IPS model with pretty good fidelity and apply it to a different population and have impacts it seems like a fairly large finding for us. We think it's a big deal. Um, the, uh, it's a, so it's a rare example of an integrated program that has been successful in the short term for TANF recipients There hasn't that have disabilities. There hasn't been a lot of uh, studies that have shown short-term increases in employment for TANF recipients with disabilities, and we're excited that this one does. And we really think this model should be replicated and evaluated in other locations. I know Minnesota's and Ramsey County is doing some ongoing research to look at longer-term outcomes, and we're very interested. Um, we're actually meeting with our board at MDRC in a little while to try to get some internal funding to think about how we can test um, IPS for TANF, TANF, TANF programs in other agents in other areas of the country, in other counties in Minnesota or whatever. We haven't worked all that out, but but we, we think this is a pretty pretty interesting and important finding. Um, on the other side, this is you know fast in IPS. We haven't resolved the world's problems. Um, earnings remain very low, even for people in, in in fast. You know, we're generally, and that's why I think. We have to start thinking about other things that might, might empower people to work more. And that's one of our challenges. Um, and also, this, this is just a general finding, is that there's, there's many people with disabilities who don't ever get on the social security system. Um, they do for a lot of reasons. Some, some just don't apply. Uh, many just don't meet the standard. You know, Unfortunately, we have a social security system that defines disability by, it's an all or nothing system. You either can work or you can't. You know? And so the, the hard part of that is we, Sometimes there are people who maybe, people who can show some work capacity can't get, sometimes get the supports they need to, to work more or stay in, work, in jobs. Others get really committed to proving that they're, quote, disabled and they quit working altogether, which is also a bad outcome. If you can work, it's probably better if you should do. So this is, you know, we still have this gap in services. I think that longer term, as policymakers, we need to address. And that's our contact information. We're gonna do questions now, do we have time? Before we um, break for lunch, does anybody have a question? Go ahead. Thank you. you discussed that the um, model is integrated between employment and mental health services. Mm -hmm. Could you touch a little bit more on um, what specific skills? Was it one mental health practitioner or was it multiple practitioners? Um, if it was one, was there a curriculum or was there yeah. a set of core principles that were utilized? We had one mental health practitioner uh, that was on the multidisciplinary team. Um, there were several folks that they might be seeing um, at our clinic as well. When it comes to curriculum, no. I mean, this was just your standard mental health services that someone might get. So they could be an individual group, uh, mental health uh, treatment. I think what made this unique is just really integrating that mental health and what, what's going on in their mental health treatment along with employment and bringing that together in an integrated way and making sure that they both understood what was happening and, and going on. Sure. Sure, sure. I mean, I think so. The question was how my passion around brain science, I like that, um, and how I see that playing out. You know, so let me give you a little context. I actually, Donna Pavetti invited me to a meeting in Washington to talk about brain science and what another project I, out of Connecticut called the Moms Group, I believe. 
partnership, mom's partnership, that was an integration of mental health, specifically around cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, stress reduction, along with employment. <clears throat> and that they were specifically looking at it from a brain science executive functioning perspective. And I'm like, light bulbs went on. I'm like, that's what we're doing. <laughs> so what I see is when you think of cognitive behavioral therapy and you think of executive functioning, a lot of that is around think people really reflecting on their thinking. I'm not a mental health professional, so I'm speaking out of turn here. Maybe Mary can talk. Um, and, and thinking about their thinking and thinking about before they act, basically. And so when you think of executive functioning, you think about pausing and reflecting and thinking about your options that are available to you that fits perfectly together. So I think that's the connection that I have. Um. Yeah, that's a good question. Right. I mean, in the disability community, that's really, we call that disclosure. Do we want, does the person that we're working with want to disclose that they have some sort of disability or working with us and that sort of thing? And that really is an individual choice. It's really up to that, that participant if they want to do that. What we do find generally is um, maybe initially they're going to be more resistant to that and say, you know, that yes, I'm working with somebody and resistant about disclosing about their disability and, and, and the, the supports that they have. But we do notice that over time that they're more likely to do that the more we work with them and seeing that, wow, this is important for me to be successful in my work. So it's hard to say. It's really individualized to that person. Okay, then we're gonna break for lunch. And what I'd like to ask people to do over lunch is to have a conversation at your tables about what has this made you think about? Where do you think the ideas are or the opportunities to either learn more, think more, integrate some of the ideas you've heard into your programs? The idea behind this day was not just to um, have people learn new things, but also to think about where can you use those new ideas so that we can hopefully do a better job. So I just would encourage people to have that conversation about what really struck you um, and what do you think maybe you could do in whatever world you walk in differently that might be able to use some of what um, you heard today. And also think about what else, what questions do you have and what do you want to learn more about?